Well, let's bring in a guy that uh, watched the game closely uh, and uh, certainly had comments uh, after the game, had comments this morning on Breakfast on Broad, and he's the co-host of their In the Nest, too, when they do the uh, day after press conference. That's Barrett Brooks. Barrett, welcome to the show. How are you, buddy? Good, good, Scott. You know, what's going on? Pete, what's the deal? I mean, I understand exactly <laughs> what you guys are saying, man. It's terrible that uh, he thinks that, you know, you can just say whatever you want to say, and we're going to take it. Yeah, I mean, at this point, I can't say that I agree with that. You know, I played football. He said, well, maybe you guys didn't play football. You don't quite understand the dynamics of what goes on with a play call. Well, I'm here to tell you, I played football. I coached football also. And I still didn't understand why you would have 11 personnel in there, number one. And number two, with 11 personnel, is just one running back and one tight end. When you had such success with three tight ends, one running back, which is 13 personnel, the fact that Ryan Matthews, uh, 120 uh, yards at that point with five minutes left in the game. He has he wasn't even in the game, but yet he doesn't end up on the incident report. What is going on? I don't understand it. Yeah, when he uses that word layman, you know, maybe you layman think like, you know, he's basically taking a shot at fans or second guessers, I suppose. Barrett, I thought I heard last night on the postgame show, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought I heard Michael B. make a comment that, well, Doug's taking longer to get to his press conferences now because he's stopping with a member of the PR staff and sort of prepping before he walks out there, which I thought, like, say what? Like, he needs to get, like, a pop quiz before he goes out and gets grilled? Is, is that well, true? even the president does that. You know, even the president does that. But still, though, I mean, I understand uh, him. You know, he, he's, lost that, he's lost that fight. You know, he's lost that battle. Um, you know, considering the fact that, you know, when he does do press interviews, um, he usually turns out saying something that doesn't really correlate with what's going on in the game, number one. And also, number two, fans just aren't good with it, and, and the media is just not good with it. You know, you have to understand it's a delicate balance that you have to have, especially with, you know, the, you know a top-five market, when especially with, um, you know, us as fans, you know, we're a lot more knowledgeable than most fan bases. So we do our homework, so you just can't tell us, you know, um, anything and, and then we'll be good with it you know we're going to research it we're going to try to you know delve in it a little more than just regular fans barrett uh, as you said you were a former player um so i'm really curious from a player's perspective players aren't stupid i mean they see what who was out on the field at that for that two-point conversion they know ryan matthews wasn't out there um what are players saying about that yesterday on the way home from baltimore and even today I think that his players believe in it. You know, what I mean, if it wasn't for that free blitzer, mostly, you know, you know, going in and and we had to run it down. You know, that and that and I think that's basically what he's saying as far as famous terms. You know, he wanted it, he should have said it a lot better than he what he did. What it is, he had eleven personnel in it. They went to an empty formation. When they went to the empty formation, they're going to go into zero coverage. Zero coverage is everybody that can that can possibly catch the ball is covered man to man. Everybody else is not covering somebody, man, and a receiver or a running back or a tight end that's out in the formation. They're going to blitz. They're going to come in. We're going to try. They're going to try to get more blitzers than there are men to block them. And in that protection, you have five down offensive linemen against the world. So there's five guys out there covering receivers, and then the rest are sitting there blitzing. You know, which is which is six against that five. So somebody's going to come open. Somebody's going to be a free blitzer, and it just so happens the free blitzer was able to um, tip the ball, which led to an errant pass. I understand. You know, if you can get the ball out, it's a pretty much an easy catch on a slant route to Jordan Matthews. Well, I would say that we were any other team, but this is the Eagles. You know, and there's a lot of circumstances where our guys drop the ball majority of the time. But I mean, I think it would have been a, a good play if they would have executed it. You know, if that free blitzer didn't tip the ball, it would have been a pretty seamless catch for Jordan Matthews for the touchdown, and here they win the game. We wouldn't be talking about this right now. But they did. So since they didn't, we have to talk about it. We have to talk about the play selection. I'm all good with being aggressive and going for it, for going for two. But if you're going to go in and say it's about statistics, it's about, you know, the chances are there's a 50-50 chance, well, how about you already got the positive side of the 50 when you went to it the first time? <laughs> you trying to go to the well again, of course it's not going to happen because you just said 50-50 chance. You already got the good side of the 50, so of course it's going to be the negative side of the 50 this time. You talk about like play. Quarters. You talk about play calling, Barrett, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on uh, 
if you're going to go for it on fourth and two in the fourth quarter when the game is still on the line at that point too, why? You know, what, what did you? I guess take me through what you thought when it was a jet sweep to Nelson Aguilar Nelson on Aguilar. fourth and two. I was appalled. I was like, "What are we doing? When has he made a play? When has he been that dynamic of a player <laughs> that we would trust him to get a fourth down?" I mean, come on now. I mean, common sense, you know, would dictate that. If anybody, we wouldn't put it in Nelson's hand. You know, I'm sorry. You know, he's a great kid. You know, he's working his way through, um, you know, whatever stuff he has going on. But I just didn't see that it was a good opportunity for him to, to make a play on that. If you look at it, you know, okay, you got, you know, fourth and two. Try to jump over him. Be aggressive. Run downhill. This is a guy who said he wanted to get a fast guy that's out there in the open, try to make make something happen. Well, if anybody, it's not going to be Nelson Aguilar is going to make it happen. He's not that guy. We don't think that he's aggressive enough. I don't think he's aggressive enough to go in there and stick his head in there. That's the bottom line. I thought it was a bad play call, especially when you run it in between the tackles, as good as you are with Matthews. Another, another uh, I'm curious about your player's perspective again from how this is playing perhaps behind the scenes. Rodney McLeod not challenging Dixon on that touchdown run. Uh, it was a big play in the game. Clearly, Eagles were still very much in it at that point as they were all the way to the end. What did you think of that? You know what? I think that this is new wave players and how they approach tackling. I think that he was really trying to, you know, tackle the ball as supposed to tackle a player. And I see a lot of players get caught up in that. Instead of going and tackling a player first, holding them up for other guys to come in and try to strip the ball, they try to tackle the ball first and then they tackle the player. You can take a full ride anytime you do that. These guys understand that you're going to try to do that. The receivers understand that you're going to try to do that. The running back understands you're going to try to do that. They're going to hold it with two hands, and while they're doing it, they're still pressing forward trying to gain yards. Stop trying to tackle the ball and attack the receiver. DB, I mean, attack the, um, the receiver, attack the running back, attack who has the ball first, then you have your guys to come in second and strip the ball. Stop trying to tackle the ball first. You know, it doesn't make sense. Make sure you get them down first. And, you know, in the process of that, have somebody else come in and clean them up and, uh, and see if you can knock the ball out. Too many times they try to tackle the ball as opposed to trying to tackle the guy running the ball. Period, point blank. Barrett Brooks with us. Eagles pre and post breakfast on broad joins us each Monday for Barrett's breakdown here on 97.3 ESPN. Barrett, that uh, some of the graphics you guys use on post game, uh, I'll just be flat honest with our listeners. Some of the graphics that go up, I grab them and I say, that's a fantastic graphic. I'm going to talk about that tomorrow. And the one that was not coming up in the clutch Eagles final possessions in close games. It's like a broken record. Week five at the Lions, week six at the Redskins, week eight at the Cowboys, week nine at the Giants, week 15 at the Redskins, and then the game against the Ravens. All those games, the Eagles in, all those games, the Eagles lose. What's the through factor in your mind that they can't finish games? Why aren't they able to finish games? Well, you know, I'm on the opposite side of the spectrum than Seth is. Seth thinks to think we have enough talent to win the game. Since, hence, they're so close during that time period. Well, it's the teams that have the talent that you get you over the top, that you go on and you rely on to make those plays, you know, you're talking about. Look at the guys that made plays uh, in those games we lost. Guys like Dez Bryant. Players like that go out there and impact the game more because they become those dynamic players during dynamic situations, situations in which you have to take the game over. We don't have those type of players. We have one on offense, and that's Sproles, and he wasn't in the game at the time. He wasn't available for them to have. He's the most explosive player on offense that we have. I think it's a case of these guys don't know how to win, number one, and number two, they just don't have the personnel to really be those big game type of players, you know, and that's what happens. The big players, the big time guys, that, you know, with the with the uh, with the intensity of fortitude, the want to finish games. Those are the guys that win. They'll eventually learn this, but just not this year. They're not ready, and nor do they have the personnel to take them over the top to win these close games like this. But they do get some talent back this week. In fact, today, walking into the NovaCare Complex, Lane Johnson returns to the lineup and returns to the roster. And Doug Peterson asked about him, and he, they said, what's your report on Lane? He says, I haven't seen him. I don't know. But you're starting him? <laughs> and then he says, who else do I have left? As he rattles through, uh, what impact will Lane Johnson coming back have on this football team? 
Well, I mean, regardless, you know, I haven't seen him yet either. You know, and I'm pretty sure he's going to come in in shape, but he won't be coming in, coming in in game time shape. He's going to be a little rough. Well, he's going to be a lot rusty. But him being a lot rusty, I think, is way better than Isaac Sayamalo being out there, who hasn't who's only played in uh, two games during his whole college career at tackle. The rest of them were at guard and in uh, and, and, and center. So he will definitely be an upgrade. I think there'll be more balance with him being there. And they're going to have to run the ball with him simply because they don't know what he can do offensively as far as pass blocking. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's much easier fundamentally to run block as opposed to pass blocking. I think that's why you had the, the you know, definite balance, you know, early in the game with the run to pass ratio simply because – they understood that you could not put Sam in position like you did Big V. You can't allow him to go out there and, and, and go one-on-one against guys that, you know, get paid to rush the passer. It wouldn't be fair to him. It wouldn't be fair to your rookie quarterback. So I think they'll try to run the ball the same way they did, oppose their will on this team. And also – this Giants secondary, uh, secondary has become a lot better since the last time they played them. So they've been blitzing a lot more, making sure they hug up on receivers and uh, dictating what routes they need to run um, as, uh, on the offensive side of the ball. So they're a much better team than they were the last time they played them. And I really think that, you know, they're going to have to run the ball just because, um, you know, Lane's not in shape right now and they don't know what he can do as far as pass blocking. Barrett, uh, we were talking about some of those questionable decisions earlier. We now have 14 games worth of Doug Peterson as a head coach. Uh, I, I I was down there covering the game yesterday. I uh, heard from a different media member that, uh, you know, Jeffrey Laurie went into the locker room pretty irate, uh, believed to be why Ryan Matthews wasn't on the field is why he was upset. Uh, I witnessed Laurie talking to Brandon Graham with Brian Dawkins standing there, and it was a serious conversation reading body language. My question to you is, do you think that Jeffrey Lurie has started taking, um, I, I guess, you know, hearing from his players about what they think, like he did last year with Chip Kelly, and do, where would you put the odds at whether or not Doug Peterson is back at this point? I think he will be back because he handpicked him to pretty much do exactly what he's doing now and, and, that's, and you know, trying to motivate his team you know he wanted a, a more player friendly coach and that's what he's getting in Doug you can't expect a guy to, to go in and, and, and be an all-star coach you know coming out the shoot he made you know even a great Belichick you know fell when he was at Cleveland so you know he's going to need a little time to develop like I said this is he's learning on the fly he's a rookie we have to understand that he's only had six years of college coaching I mean uh, NFL coaching and now he's press pressing the uh, position to be the guy, the head guy of a team. Um, I think he's a little over his head with, with calling the plays and monitoring the team, um, you know, as, as the head coach. So he's learning this. He's learning on the fly. He, and, and I think he will be better than he is um, this year, next year. I don't think he's in any jeopardy of, of losing losing his job. I uh, think they have who they want. And, they're, and they're, I mean, they're, they're pleased and they understand that he's going to have a little learning curve uh, that he's going to have to fight through before he becomes the next Andy Reid, or, or so they think. You mentioned the play calling, and I've been for weeks, a couple weeks now, kind of wondering how would Doug Peterson, the head coach, do if he took Doug Peterson, the offensive coordinator, and let Frank Reich be that guy? Uh, how does that happen? I mean, do you do you think that do you think that Frank Reich, number one, I think I know the answer to this, that Frank Reich should be given the opportunity to call plays for these last two games, and number two, how would that go about? Would it have to totally be Doug Peterson saying? You know what, Frank? I want to let you have a shot at this for these last two games, and I'll just be the head coach. Well, it would absolutely have to be that. It wouldn't be anybody in the organization besides Doug that would make that decision. I don't think the head. I mean, I don't think that um, Jeffrey Lurie would do that, and I, and I really don't think that the GM would do that either. Harry Rosen would go in there and tell him that either. It would have to be. Um, you know, a, a, a sense that, you know, just like Big Red did it for him, saying, all right, you call the second half of these games, as we were told, you know, and I can only go by what we were told, you call the second half of these games. I'm giving you the responsibility of calling plays at this time. It's not like Frank Wright hasn't done it before. He did it in San Diego for years. He's a pretty good um, offensive coordinator when given the opportunity to go out there and be that. And, you know, it just comes with, you know, Doug really trusted the coaches that he implemented in place. Um, it's not that he doesn't trust, you know, Frank Ryan. I think it's more so he wants to have, you know, total control of the offense. He's putting his name behind it. So why not, you know, go in and, and be that play caller? Uh, I don't know if this is going to happen. In fact, I doubt seriously if that this will happen. But, hey, you know, maybe, you know, he turns a leaf. You know, they've done, you know, I've seen plenty of teams do it, and it's, 
some teams don't have success in doing it. Barrett Brooks with us here on the Sports Bash on 97.3. Barrett, you know, uh, with Scott here, and he was in the locker room, and you were watching the game in the studio, and I'm watching the game at home, and so everybody gets different perspectives of where they see things. But I guess uh, one of the reporters got a hold of Jalen Mills after the game yesterday to specifically ask about the touchdown that was given up to Steve Smith right before the half. And Jalen Mills came out and said, for sure it wasn't the coverage I wanted, but players play and coaches make calls and I have to make the play. And then, I mean, he said, I'm not going into what coverage I wanted. Pro catch touchdown. I was locking dudes down there until that one play. Was it a call I wanted to be in? No. But regardless, plays have to be made in a game like this. There's Jalen Mills, who Scott has accurately pointed out as a rookie, and he's calling out his defensive coordinator. Well, he needs to be quiet because he wasn't really locking anybody down. You know, I don't know, you know, what game he was watching. I don't know where he's been all season. If he wanted to be a man, a man on that play, he's got to be crazy. Steve Smith is a wily veteran. He understands what he needs to play. A lot. That's why they scored the touchdown going into halftime. This was the best defense he could have had. This is a custom-made defense for these type of situations. They were in cover two, and in cover two, when you have a vertical route at the number one, who Smith was the number one. He ran a go route. In cover two, anytime your number one goes vertical, you have to lock on to him, man. There was nobody that immediately came in and threatened the, threatened, um, the flats where his responsibility was. So he's supposed to latch on, stay man, and go over the top. He didn't do that. He got beat. But the biggest part of the, the whole mix-up on that play was Jalen Watkins. Jalen Watkins should have, um, once he saw number two was the inside receiver from number one, who Jalen Mills was on, once that guy stopped the route or, and went inside a little bit, that took the earnest of his responsibility on covering him off. And he's got to be the deepest man that he should have ran like the Dickens to get over the top of number one, considering the fact that that's his half of the field. They were in a, a coverage where cover two, he had half the field in the corner, had um, the quarters. To, I mean, not quarters, but, you know, the flats to um, to half that field also. So it was just a bad play by both guys. Both guys weren't able to make the play, and that's simply because they just didn't, you know, look at the playbook. They didn't understand that these guys are going to do this. This yeah. is a simple play. He should have been over to Jalen Mills. Jalen Walker should have been over the top. Jalen Mills should have latched on to him, man, period, point blank. They both busted on the play. They both were evenly responsible as far as why – T. Smith was able to score on that touchdown. That's Barrett Brooks telling you why for the fifth straight game, the Eagles' defense is allowed 26 points or more. Of course, Barrett talks to us today on Mondays. We have to wait until tomorrow to find out what Jim Schwartz has to say. Well, Barrett, it's a short week, and you played the game, and you know we've gone ad nauseum on how these Thursday night NFL games are lacking a quality because the week is so short. You're in that. You were in that. Lock, if you were in the locker room yesterday, and now you're on the bus home, and now you're trying to get ready for the Giants, what's the players' mindset as they're getting ready for a short week and their health and their physicality and all that other stuff? What are they thinking on this short week? How do they get ready for the Giants? To be honest, they're loving it. You know, they want to play in this short week simply because the weekend, and this is just deep being honest from a player's perspective, the weekend is Christmas. They're going to have off Christmas. So that's exactly what they're thinking at this point. Okay, we're going to play Thursday. That means we have a long weekend. We're spending it with our family. I think that's their mindset. Yes, they're going to want to win, and their focus is on being on, 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 on winning. But at the end of the day, they're going to be an all right then. After this game is over, we're going to be with our families for Christmas. That's in a nutshell. That's as real as I can be. You heard it here. That's exactly what they're thinking at this point. And Barrett Brooks will get to be with his family as well, and we know uh, who's the CEO of the Brooks family, so say hello to her for us too, Barrett. Uh, Barrett Brooks, every Monday here will. on the Sports <laughs> Bash on 97.3. Barrett, we really appreciate it. Hey, today we didn't have to fight you off from your nap or anything because the press conference timed out perfect. This worked out just fine, right? Absolutely. I pulled right in front of my house and I was able to talk to you guys. As soon as I saw the number come up, for 97, I got a call to talk to my boys, man. <laughs> Thank That's, you, Barrett. Yeah, we really appreciate it. Take care, Barrett. Merry Christmas to you, sir. Take care, guys.